Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Kubernetes optimization focused on the highest impact actions webinar. My name is Daniela and I'll be the moderator for today's session. I'm excited to introduce Henry Jurgens, SVP Product and Operations at Densify. Hello, Henry. Good morning. Who will lead today's sessions and take us through three key factors of optimizing Kubernetes as well as a customer example. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Henry to get us started. Thank you. What I'm going to talk about is picking your Kubernetes optimization battles wisely. And I'm going to start with the statement that when, when we as a company have worked with our customers, we've noticed that Kubernetes environments are often drastically over-provisioned. And that over-provisioning, of course, drives higher than expected infrastructure costs. And as you start thinking about how to optimize such an environment, most are motivated by saving money, they need to understand the factors at play. So I'm gonna highlight three factors. The first one being in our experience container, allocations are usually wrong, and I'll have some data that shows you that. The second one I'm gonna state is that not all containers are created equal. And the third point, it is possible to drive big savings with low effort. So let's start on the first point. Container allocations are usually wrong. So this is an example visualization that we have from our product that shows one of our larger customer environments where there is probably over 10,000 containers in that environment. And this is representing histograms where the counts are the number of containers going on the y-axis. And then across the x-axis is groupings showing how much resource is currently allocated as a percent of what is required. So things that are green in the center means it's right on. Things that are over to the right in the yellow colors means that it would be under allocated, too much resources. And then on the left in the red, it means that there's not enough resources and things are at risk. And then we show for containers in Kubernetes that you have requests for both CPU and memory, and you have the limits for the CPU and memory. So if I focus in on some key points here, you can see for CPU requests in this environment, there's like 4,500 containers that have over five times the amount of CPU resources they need. Then you can look at the memory requests in this case, there's like a thousand containers here that have less than one fifth of the memory that's needed. So that can cause lots of different types of risks. You can see again on the memory side, there's just a ton of things that are over allocated that they have way too big an allocation of memory. And uh, interestingly enough, if you looked at this at aggregate, that would kind of balance out and things would look okay. But this histogram shows that they're not. Almost everything is wrong. Another one, you can see this gray bar is showing that, you know, a lot of these um, containers don't have any memory limits set. That can also cause issues, such as if there's a memory leak, you can end up compromising a node in the environment. So the main key thing I wanted to state here, big environment and a lot of things are not set correctly. So I'm gonna focus in on the CPU request side of things as I go through the examples in this presentation. So now let's talk about the impact of oversized CPU requests. And it could be oversized memory requests would be equivalent but I'm gonna focus on CPU requests. Um, and essentially the way Kubernetes works is that the node resources get allocated out, but oftenly, often you will see that they are not properly utilized. So in this case, it looks quite good if you look at the CPU requests, it's running around 80% of the node capacity. So the Kubernetes scheduler is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. But when you start looking at the actual utilization of the nodes in this cluster, the average utilization is like 7%. So I should mention on these charts that, you know, you can see that we've got the dates across the X axis. It's about a week of information. And then on the Y axis on the left, it's a CPU reservations as a percent of the capacity. And on the right is a CPU utilization as a percent of capacity. 
And I will say when we've looked at a lot of our customers' clusters, they look very, very much like this. In most cases, we see you know, under a 20% utilization, often around 10%. Now, what a lot of people forget is that as you put requests to your Kubernetes containers, these are not virtual CPUs. Some people have experience with um, platforms like VMware where you have things like overcommit. Well, that's not the way Kubernetes works. As you give out these requests or I ask for them, it's basically going to schedule and hand you real CPUs. Hence why you get these effects of over allocation on the container side, driving real low utilization on the nodes. And that's essentially a way of stranding capacity and stranding capacity will drive higher costs than expected. Well, what's the result of that unexpected cost? You got some folks in finance losing their minds and I'd say they're rightly losing their minds based on the data they're looking at. They're going, hey, I'm looking at utilization. The utilization is very low in the environment. We must be overpaying. But on the other hand, you have the platform owners that are managing this environment and they're experts on Kubernetes and they're kind of feeling defensive. They're right as well. They're like, hey, you don't understand the way Kubernetes works. I am just providing the amount of nodes that are required to service the containers that I'm running. And that's all due to that over allocation on the request side on the containers. The good news, well, you can optimize these nodes after you tackle optimizing those container requests and getting rid of that standard or stranded capacity. So let's go to the second point. It's important one, not all containers are created equal. So I'm gonna use an analogy of stones versus sand. And it's just a way of visualizing that containers can have wildly different sizes, wildly different behaviors. Um, people are specifying in a manifest file how much CPU memory requests and limits. And that's that little red box on the right-hand side. And you know, these things can then be replicated to many, many copies. So you can say, I'm gonna have a stone that's replicated 300 times as an example. So when we're thinking about sand, an example would be microservices. They're really tiny, they're small, they're often transient, they blip in and out, and that's exactly what they're designed to do. Then you've got the stones. These things are maybe longer duration or more complex utilization patterns. Um, sometimes they've been legacy apps that have just been quickly converted to running in a large container and not re-architected into smaller services. And I'll tell you, when we look at a lot of our customer environments at scale, there is a lot of sand compared to stones. So here's an example. It's a histogram. We're on the left-hand y-axis going up. We've got the count of the number of container manifests. So a manifest to us is where you specify the resources a container is gonna get and the amount of those containers that you want in a replicated deployment. So this environment has over 14,000 container configurations. And interestingly enough, more than 10,000 of these have less than 0.2 CPU cores. And on the X axis at the bottom, Essentially, we're just showing the amount of CPU requests in cores, you know, in small increments from, you know, zero, the, the big line at the left on the histogram, the bar is showing um, those containers that have between zero and 0 0.1 cores. And then you can see the next one is the 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 cores. Those two add up to over 10,000. And then we have that same kind of um, increments by one tenth of a core until I get to two and then everything above two, you can see that there's 632 container manifests that are requesting more than two cores. Now, just a reminder, these containers are running on nodes. So there's physical or maybe virtualized infrastructure in the public cloud, for example, that need to be present to run these 14,000 containers, and there's 520 nodes in this environment. And again, another reminder to optimize the nodes, you need to have some strategy for optimizing the container allocations. 
So this is a sample analysis showing part of our product UI where we provide recommendations for all the container manifests, the data that's specified when you are requesting resources and the number of containers in a deployment. So we'll collect the data, we do a deep analysis, and then we provide recommendations on how you should optimize your requests and limits for CPU and memory. And I'm just gonna highlight two examples here. So this first one, it has a surplus on the CPU requests of 760 millicores, almost a full core. And that's a deployment that is uh, making 24 copies of each container. So that means for this one deployment, there's 18 cores in surplus, just for that one thing. Then if I go down and I look at, well, I'll call you know a, a small piece of sand. This is a single container that's in the deployment. It's only requiring 10 millicores, so a really small amount. It wasn't even specified. And when you, you put this into context, this is 1,800 times less than the surplus. So what it needs in total is less by 1,800 times than the surplus for the first example. So the key point here is with thousands of containers, you got to pick your battles wisely when you start optimizing. And I'll just state, don't get distracted by the sand. It can be noise in a very large scale environment. So that drives us to the idea that it is possible to drive big savings with low effort. So let's continue to go through this customer example. So I'm gonna start with, again, that 14,000 container environment. There's the histogram of the way the CPU requests are kind of laid out across those containers. Now, this is a plot where on the x-axis, I am showing the recommendations, the number that you've taken, ordered by the biggest impact to the smallest impact. And on the y-axis, I am showing how much cumulative savings you would get as you work through taking those highest to lowest priority recommendations. So, um, in this case, out of that 14,000 containers, I'm focusing on those containers that are over allocated, that they have too much resources, and there's 10,299 of those containers. And from a monthly perspective, we're estimating that you would save 124,000 and a bit dollars per month if you would take all of the recommendations. If you start to dig in onto the data, well, if you would tackle 10% of the recommendations or 1,030, you're already gonna get 57% of the savings. So that's you know almost $71,000 by doing 10% of the recommendations. You can see on the right hand side, I am highlighting inside that histogram what that means. So that's, you know, kind of everything that's above 1.9 CPU requests would be that bucket of containers. If you looked at the top 20%, now 2060 containers, you'll get 76% of the savings. So that's like almost $95,000. And you can see that's looking like about half of the x-axis of the histogram on that inlay. Now, the interesting thing is if you wanted to just tackle the savings from the last 50%, so all the cumulative savings from going from 90 to 100%, that would be 5,150 recommendations, and that's going to give you $11,800 of savings, less than 10%. Out of interest, I was just curious, well, what would I need to do to get $11,800 in savings in this environment? And I can do a half a percent, 55 recommendations would get me that $11,800. So really showing that there is essentially an 80-20 type of rule working where you can get 80% of the value, in this case, lower your costs per month by 80% by doing 20% of the work, by tackling 20% of the manifested entities. I am now going to talk about the, um, use the term worst offender, and I've kind of, you know, um, been a little cute by calling it a pebble that's disguised as a boulder, really wants to feel like a boulder, but actually isn't. So that's a single deployment. 
So there's 309 copies of a container, and I'm again focusing on the CPU requests where every container that's copied is getting 8,000 millicores, so like eight cores for every single container. And after our analysis, we see that that really only needs about 4,300 millicores per container. So that's almost a surplus of four cores for every container. And when you multiply that out, that gives you a surplus of 1,145 cores for one thing. So one recommendation, if you would tackle this, you would say, you know, a request for 1,145 cores and the way Kubernetes works, it is going to hold that number of cores for you and not let other containers run in that environment because it's got to guarantee that space for this pebble that's disguised as a boulder. So I'm going to leave you with a few parting thoughts. First one, a reminder, most Kubernetes container environments are large. And when we look at many of our customers, they're only getting larger as more and more um, applications are being containerized. And from our experience, they are usually over-provisioned, uh, meaning that the amount of utilization on the nodes is very low, and that is often caused by this over-allocation of container requests. Now, that is driving unexpected higher infra infrastructure costs. We hear a lot of our customers saying that, you know, there was an expectation that by going to containers, they would actually be saving money. There's a lot of good reasons um, to, to transition over to containers and re-architect your applications, but there is a bit of shock in the industry that people are saying, wow, this is way more expensive than I thought. And a lot of that is caused by not being able at large scale to provide the right requested resources for your CPU and memory at the container level. Again, not all containers are created equal. We've been pretty clear and we've shown with real data that there can be vast differences in the size of container deployments. We use the analogy of sands versus stones. And we've looked at many of our large scale customer accounts and we always see this concept of this 80-20 rule that you can get 80% of the savings by optimizing 20% of your containers. And if you go after the high priority worst offenders first, we often see that there are a handful of these kind of pebbles disguised as a boulder, these massively over allocated containers that are copied hundreds of times. And for folks that uh, we, I often like to think of people can become a hero in their companies by in a very smart way, going after optimization with low effort that can, can show a big impact in terms of saving money. So the one thing I would like to highlight as well is a lot of containers will run on public cloud infrastructure. And Densify also provides cloud resource optimization solutions for public cloud. And we've recently been named a market leader by GigaOM. And you can follow this link to get a full copy of that analyst report if you're interested. It's easy to get it, just follow that link. The other thing I was gonna highlight is that um, Densify has a partnership with Intel where we have something that together we call Intel Cloud Optimizer powered by Densify. And for organizations that qualify, Intel will sponsor a full year of the use of our software, providing a subscription so that you can try it out, you can get full value, you can use that year to ramp it up. And um, we, we've had a lot of successful engagements with companies with that level of sponsorship from Intel. Perfect. Some resources that may be of interest. We do have a poster available for download. This poster covers the histograms that Henry had mentioned earlier and essentially the visualization of 12 risks associated with Kubernetes resource management. Again, you can just scan the QR codes to get a direct link to these resources. And lastly, Densify has recently launched a podcast, which we're quite excited about. It's hosted by our own CTO, Andrew Hillier, and it focuses on interviews with IT and technical leaders 
Each episode dives right into conversations about your careers, as well as insights into the latest cloud trends and best practices. We do currently have a couple episodes live, one with a leader at Liberty Mutual and a second with a leader at FactSet. And launching this week, we will have another episode live with Intel. So again, scan the QR code to check that out. If you are interested in learning more about Densify and keeping up with the latest news, just follow us on social. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to you, Henry. If you've got any questions, we have some time here. I do have a question. Someone was asking about more details related to uh, the customer example. I was showing. Uh, of course, I think you would understand that I can't provide uh, um, too much information. But what I can say, um, that larger 14,000 container environment, it was for a large retail company that has a global footprint. And it, let's say, does a, a lot of online sales. A lot of retail companies do that. This was a container environment that was in support of that part of that retail company's business. Okay, awesome. So again, we've made really good time. We hope you did enjoy today's session. Thanks again. Thank you, Henry, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now.